Egyptian mathematics is sometimes called cumbersome and primitive by modern scholars. However, upon examination, we find that rather than primitive fumbling, the Egyptians were using a method of calculation precisely like our modern computers. Michael Schneider, mathematician, geometer, author of A Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe, provides an insight into these Egyptian methods. The mathematics used in modern computers is identical with the mathematics that was used in ancient Egypt. Um, and I'll show you how that works. Today, when we write a number, we work in powers of 10 and place value. We have the ones, the tens, the hundreds, columns. So if you wanted to say 472, we're really saying four one hundredths, seven tens, plus two ones. Um, but the way that this occurs in modern computers is uh, not place 10 value, but place 2 value. So the, pa the powers are 1s, 2s, 4s, 8s, 16s, and so forth. So if a uh, computer wants to think of the number uh, uh, 16, um, let's say, well, if a computer wants to look at the number, let's say, 14, it's 1, 8, 1, 4, it's 12, 1, 2, and no ones. This kind of uh, arithmetic is appropriate for computers because they deal with electricity, which can either be on, represented by one, or off, represented by zero. The flow of electricity or no flow of electricity is powers of two. Now, the way the ancient Egyptians developed this can be seen in the way that they would multiply. Now, neither the ancient Egyptians nor the modern computers use a times table. Times table is something we teach children in school, and it has to be memorized. But it's really inappropriate for a computer. And I'll show you how, uh, for example, that works. The modern computer designers, as well as the ancient Egyptians, were aware of, were aware of a mathematical fact that any number can be uh, shown to consist of the sum of powers of two. What I mean by that is if we write the powers of 2, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so forth, you notice there's a doubling going on. And any number can be represented by the sum of these. For example, if we wanted to choose the number 17, that's 16 plus 1. So you can count 1, 2, 1 plus 2 make 3, 4, 1 plus 4 make 5, 2 plus 4 make 6, 1 plus 2 plus 4 make 7, 8, and so forth. And so any number can be represented by this, the sum of elements of this sequence. So if I wanted to multiply two numbers, let's say we wanted to multiply 17 by 25. In order to multiply the way the Egyptians did and the way that computers do, all you have to know is how to double numbers like this and how to add two numbers together. No multiplication table needed to be memorized. So 17 tw times 25, I've identified the elements of 17 as 1 plus 16. And in this column, I write the number 25, and I just keep doubling it. Twice 25 is 50, twice that, 100, twice that, 200, twice that, 400. So in order to know the product of 17 times 25, we just have to look at which numbers are circled over here and circle the corresponding ones over here and add them together. So 17 times 25 is 400 plus 25, or 425. It's that simple. No memorization, no times table, no tiers in the third grade about this. And this is how computers do it as well, the, except instead of circling or not circling a number, they would have a 1 or a 0. So in other words, the number 17 in binary arithmetic by computers is one zero 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 one, or electricity, no, 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 and electricity. And that will give us the sum, and that's how this works. Now division in computers or in ancient Egypt is just the opposite of multiplication, it's the inversion. So let's say we wanted to divide mm, 1,075 by 25. Now we don't want to use the multiplication table, nor do we want to use any kind of long division. And the way to do it is like this, simply write out the powers of 2, 1, 4, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and so forth. Here again, just the powers, the, the doubling of 25, 50, double that 100, 200, 400, 
800. I stopped there because if I went further, it's 1600, which is lar larger than 1,075. And if I know that 1,075 is 800 plus 200, make 1,000 and 50 and 25. I just have to look across at the numbers that correspond there, or in a computer, there would be electrical circuit. And if I know that 32 plus 8 is 40, 42, 43, so 1,075 divided by 25 is 32 plus 8 plus 2 plus 1, 43. No multiplication table, no long division, no carrying, no borrowing. It's just very straightforward. Now, how did the ancient Egyptians know this? Well, I might add that also the ancient Chinese knew this. The binary system of powers of two is also the basis of the uh, trigrams and hexagrams of the I Ching, the flowing nature of the universe, how things turn into one another in a flowing process in a binary kind of a pulsation. So this kind of arithmetic was also known to the Chinese as well. Now, did the modern computer people look to the ancient Egyptians or the Chinese? No. In fact, they didn't look to each other. But they all looked to the same place, and that is to the eternal principles of mathematics. And the Egyptians were quite adept at looking at eternal principles. What happens next in several prior videos, especially on my other channel, including the following clip that I'd like to include in this presentation, which explores an alternative mathematics which Tesla himself was aware of and could hold keys to freeing mankind from those that would prefer to enslave it. A vortex is most commonly defined as a mass of whirling fluid or air, especially a whirlpool or whirlwind in which the flow rotates around an axis line. So it's a mass of something that spins around and pulls objects down into its center or when the spin around the center draws the outside in. That's a vortex. And math is often defined as the science of numbers, quantities, and shapes, and the relations between them. So vortex-based mathematics can be understood as a new way of understanding numbers, not just as mere quantities, but where each has its own unique quality, archetype, and behavior. While several mainstream sources have denounced this idea, calling it New Age pseudomath, the truth is that this alternative form of mathematics is not new at all, and actually is quite ancient, with similar concepts having been found etched on Babylonian clay tablets dating back several millennia. This non-linear, holistic view of math was also revered by none other than Nikola Tesla, who famously stated that, quote, if you knew the magnificence of the three, six, and nine, you would have a key to the universe, end quote. Tesla believed that numbers had extreme importance, and so did the ancient Greek philosopher Pythagoras, who around 500 BC was famously quoted as saying, all is number. The basic principle of vortex math is that all numbers can be reduced down to single digits, from one to nine. And this form of reduction is common in many forms of occult practices, commonly referred to as numerology, which is any belief in the divine or mystical relationship between a number and one or more coinciding events. It's also the study of the numerical value of letters in words, names, and ideas, and often associated with astrology or Kabbalah, where letters are assigned a numeric value. That said, the process of reducing a number down to one digit between one and nine is also common practice not only in numerology, but also in mainstream science, such as with computer programming. So, for example, a number such as 12 would be reduced to 3 by adding 1 plus 2. The number 10 would be reduced to 1 by adding 1 plus 0. The number 99, for example, would be reduced by adding 9 plus 9, making 18, and further reduced by adding 1 plus 8, 
giving us 9. Understanding this principle, let us now apply this number 1 through 9 to a circle, a concept that was made famous in modern times by a gentleman named Marco Rodin, but which as I said earlier is actually very ancient. Notice the lines in the center, which resemble the Volkswagen logo, and the special relationship between 3, 6, and 9, which we will get into later. Let us start with the number 1. When we double the number 1, we get the number 2, which is connected here with a line. When we double the number 2, we get the number 4. When we double the number 4, we get the number 8. Doubling the number 8 gives us 16. And since 16 is a double digit, we reduce it by adding 1 and 6, giving us the number 7, which as you can see is connected to the number 8 by a line. Doubling 16, we get the number 32. And after reducing 32, by adding the 3 and the 2, we get 5, which is the next number connected to the 7. When we double 32, we get 64. We then reduce that by adding the 6 and the 4, which gives us 10. So we reduce that by adding the 1 and the 0, leaving us with 1. And we're back where we started. So there's a parallel between 64 and 1 when it becomes whole again or a single unit. This is why 64 is the complete cycle for the Mayan calendar or the I Ching. Also, there are 64 possible patterns for a codon in DNA. This doubling or geometric progression is commonly found in nature and was understood by the ancients. Now, if we go backwards, meaning reduce the number one by half, we would get 0.5, which translates to 5. If we reduce 0.5 in half, we get 0.25. And after adding the 2 and 5, it leaves us with 7. Reducing 0.25 in half gives us 0.125. And adding 1 plus 2 plus 5 gives us 8. Reducing 0.125 in half gives us 0 0.0625. And adding 0 plus 6 plus 2 plus 5 leaves us with 13. And adding 1 and 3 gives us the number 4. Half of 0 0.0625 is 0 0.03125. And adding 0 plus 3 plus 1 plus 2 plus 5 gives us 11. Reducing 11 by adding 1 plus 1 leaves us with the number 2. And finally, half of 0 0.03125 is 0 0.015625. And 0 plus 1 plus 5 plus 6 plus 2 plus 5 equals 19. 1 plus 9 equals 10, and 1 plus 0 gets us right back to 1 and where we started. This cycle of doubling each number, or reducing each number by half, works with any variation of the number you start with. So for example, if you start with 100 instead of 1, and reduce it in half, or double it, and follow the procedure we just did, you will find it works out perfectly. You may have also noticed that the pattern skipped the numbers 3, 6, and 9, the numbers that Nikola Tesla said were the key to the universe. When the number 3 is doubled, we get the number 6. When 6 is doubled, we get 12. And 1 plus 2 is 3. 12 doubled becomes 24. And 2 plus 4 is 6. 24 doubled is 48 and 4 plus 8 is 12, with 1 plus 2 bringing us back to 3. 48 doubled is 96, and 9 plus 6 is 15, with 1 plus 5 giving us 6. 
So no matter how often you double the three and the six or half them, you will find the oscillating back and forth between each other. Half of six is three, half of three is 1.5, and one plus five is six. Any variation will work. Half of 30 is 15, and again, one plus five gives us six. So there's a very special relationship between three and six, a back and forth cycle, which none of the other numbers share. This finally brings us to the number nine, which is also sacred in Taoism, and we will now see why. What happens when we double the number nine? Nine becomes 18, and one plus eight is nine. 18 doubled is 36, and three plus six is nine. 36 doubled is 72, and seven plus two is nine. This goes on indefinitely. What happens when we half nine? Half of nine is 4.5, and four plus five equals nine. Half of 4.5 is 2.25, and two plus two plus five is nine. So nine is very unique, and while all the numbers are special in their own respect, nine is the only one with this property, and why it is the center, forming the axis in the middle. This is further illustrated when we look at each set of numbers on each side of the circle equaling nine. Eight plus one is nine. Seven plus two is nine. Six plus three is nine and five plus four is nine. So nine is in the middle, it separates and polarizes the numbers, turning the other numbers into a sort of mirror image, or right and left, or a positive and negative. Two sides of a coin, so to speak, two halves of a whole. Now when we take away the trinity of three, six, and nine, we are left with six numbers, the one, two, four, eight, seven, and five. And esoterically speaking, these six make up the physical world of creation, the pattern that is repeated in physicality, the underlying geometry of the material world, which is essentially hexagonal. And this can be seen in nature, such as in the formation of crystals or in snowflakes. Three, six, and nine seem to transcend the physical and are therefore considered part of the higher world, which give them special applications in terms of physics and even religion or spirituality. The rodent coil is a three-dimensional toroidal shape with this vortex math attached to it, where alternating current is run through a loop, creating a very strong magnetic field inside of the coil. When magnetic objects are placed in the center of the coil, the magnetic field created by the coil causes the magnets to rotate and even levitate. There are many claims made about this simple geometric shape, essentially made from copper wire, coiled in a specific way, such as being able to produce free energy, or at least greatly amplifying energy. There are also many skeptics. That said, Tesla's work also had many skeptics, most of it buried under government classification, but that doesn't mean it wasn't valid or useful. Scientists now accept that a material universe as the foundation of what we perceive to be our physical material world isn't quite the case. Today, physicists recognize that physical atoms are actually made up of vortices of energy that are constantly spinning and vibrating. At its smallest observable level, matter is energy, and this energy that exists all around us can be tapped into and potentially used to generate power. Quantum physics has left many scientists baffled. If quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. Everything we call real is made up of things that cannot be regarded as real. Spiritual concepts of our ancient world are directly intertwined with modern day science and especially quantum physics and Nikola Tesla was well aware of this. 
all perceptible matter comes from a primary substance or tenuity beyond conception, filling all space, the akasha or luminiferous ether, which is acted upon by the life-giving prana or creative force, calling into existence in never-ending cycles all things and phenomena. As you can see, Tesla was aware of ancient concepts and correlations it had with the science he was working on, using Sanskrit words like akasha and prana to describe the force and matter that exists all around us. These words come from ancient Aryan or Vedic texts. Another term for prana is chi in the Far East, or ether in certain occult or alchemical circles, and vril in esoteric European secret societies. This subtle bioelectromagnetic life force energy was said to be available throughout the universe and could allegedly be harnessed and redirected into a free energy technology. Before many generations pass, our machinery will be driven by a power obtainable at any point in the universe. This idea is not novel. We find it in the delightful myth of Antheus, who derives power from the earth. We find it among subtle speculations of one of your splendid mathematicians. Throughout space, there is energy. Is this energy static or kinetic? If static, our hopes are in vain. If kinetic, and this we know it is, for certain, then it is a mere question of time when men will succeed in attaching their machinery to the very wheelwork of nature.